Good evening, everybody. This is Tanetta, and I want to welcome you to my channel, Tanetta Play. And I want to thank you all for, of course, tuning in this evening. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about, this is my part number five, about the end of life, helping with comfort and care. And this topic of this um, video is called Understanding Healthcare Decisions. So we'll be talking about that throughout these um, next several pages that I'll be reading to you all. So like I said, once again, it's from our manual, The End of Life Care, if you all can see that. And it's going to be talking about understanding healthcare, healthcare decisions when we're dealing with somebody who's nearing the end of life. It says, it can be overwhelming to be asked to make healthcare decisions for someone who is dying and is no longer able to make his or her own decisions. It is even more difficult if you, if you do not have written or verbal guidance. How do you decide what type of care is right for someone? Even when you have written documents, some, de some decisions still might not be clear since the documents may not address every situation you could face. Two approaches might be helpful. One is to put yourself in the place of the person who is dying and try to choose as he or she would. This is called substituted judgment. Some experts believe that decisions should be based on substituted judgment whenever possible. And this says, this is Joseph and Leanne's story. Joseph's 90-year-old mother, Leanne, um, I'm sorry, Leilani, was in a coma after having a major stroke. The doctor said damage to Leilani's brain was widespread and she needed to be put on a breathing machine or a ventilator or she would probably die. The doctor asked Joseph if he wanted that to be done. Joseph re remembered how his mother disapproved when an elderly neighbor was put on a similar machine after a stroke. He decided to say no and his mother peacefully died a few hours later. Another approach known as best interest is to decide what will be best for the dying person. This is sometimes combined, combined with substituted judgment. Allie and Wadi's story. Allie's father, Wadi, is 80 years old and has lung cancer, as well as advanced Parkinson's disease. He is in a nursing facility and doesn't seem to recognize Ali when he visits. Wadi's doctors suggested that surgery to move part of his lung might slow down the course of the cancer and give Wadi more time. But Ali thought, what kind of time? What would that do for my dad? Ali decided that putting his dad through surgery and recovery was not in Wadi's best interest. After talking with Wadi's doctors, Ali believed that surgery would not improve his father's quality of life, but would cause him pain, pain and discomfort. And you can make that decision. It's called um, what's in the best interest of the person. If you are making decisions for someone at the end of life and are trying to use these approaches, it might be helpful to think about the following questions. Has the dying person ever talked about what he or she wants at the end of life? Has he or she ever expressed an opinion about how someone else has been treated or was being treated? What was his or her life values? What gave meaning to life? Maybe it was being close to family watching them grow and making memories together. Perhaps just being alive was the most important thing. As a decision maker, without specific guidance from the dying person, you need as much information as possible on which to base your actions. You might ask the doctor, what might we expect to happen in the next few hours, days, weeks, if we continue our current course of treatment? Why is this test being suggested? Will it change the current treatment plan? Will it, will I, I mean, will a need, I mean, will a new treatment help my relative get better? How would the new treatment change his or her quality of life? Will it give more quality time with family and friends? How long would this treatment take to make a difference? If we choose to, the, to try this treatment, can we stop it at any time and for any reason? What are the side effects of the approach you are using? If we try this new treatment and it does not work, then what? If we don't try this treatment, what will happen? Is, it, is the improvement we saw today an overall positive sign or just something temporarily? Those are questions you can definitely ask when you're in a situation when somebody's, of course, nearing the end of life. They're in a hospital setting or you, or, or, or you can actually call the nurses or the doctors, that kind of thing, to ask these 
these same questions as well. Is it a good idea to have someone with you when discussing these issues with medical staff? Having someone take notes or remember details can be very helpful in these kind of situations. So just remember that. You may not remember all of these answers to these questions, uh, but make sure you have a pad and pen to write them down or somebody else that's with you that can, of course, remember them. I guess recall the information. That would be de definitely helpful. If you are unclear about something, you are told, don't be afraid to ask a doctor or nurse to repeat it or say it a different way that makes sense to you. Always ask for them to repeat anything that you do, that you do not understand. Keep asking questions until you have all the information that you need to make your decision. Make sure you know how to contact a member of the medical team if you have more questions or if the dying person needs something. That's always um, something that you definitely want to have. Make sure you have those numbers written down um, for the doctors. If you have a hospice and palliative team, make sure that you have all those contacts and, those in and the information written down just in case anything should come up. Sometimes the whole family wants to be involved in every decision. Maybe that is the family's tradition, or maybe the dying person did not pick one person to make health care decisions before becoming unable to do so. That is not unusual, but it makes sense to choose one person to be, con to be the contact when dealing with medical staff. The doctors and the nurses will appreciate having to phone only one person. Now, I know I, we spoke about this on one of the other parts, I think it was part one or part two, um, about having just one person, like the designated person, to, of course, communicate with the, with the doctor's office, with the palliative care team, that kind of thing, about your loved one. This does cut down on a lot of miscommunication. Um, sometimes the doctor is telling one person, telling two people, then those people are going back and telling everybody different things, and everybody's getting confused. So just have one person that you designate that, you, that of course, is the... Um, is, is a speaker for the family and the ears for the family. So that person can, of course, after that meeting with that doctor, they can, of course, email everybody the information of whatever happened at that appointment or what that doctor said, or they can text the information out, or you all can call a family meeting, of course, um, whether it's on Skype or in person, to go ahead and get this information, this, um, this well, I guess, heading out to everybody else. Even if one family member is named as a decision maker, it is a good idea, as much as possible, to have family agreement about the care plan. If you can't agree on the care plan, a decision maker, or even a spokesperson, the family might consider a mediator, someone trained to bring people with different opinions to a common decision. And yes, you can, of course, pay for a mediator, unless you have somebody that's already an attorney that you know that can step in and assist you all with this process, especially if you all are having disagreement about the care plan for the person who's dying. In any case, as soon as it is clear that the patient is nearing the end of life, the family should try to discuss with the medical team which end of life care approach they want for their family member. That way, decision making for crucial situations can be planned and may feel less rushed. And you can also think when you're doing that, when you have everything already in place. In the, 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 um, the next section is called issues you may face. Maybe you are now faced with making end-of-life decisions for someone close to you. You've thought about that person's values and opinions, and you've asked the healthcare team to explain the treatment plan and what can be expected to happen. But there are other issues that are important to understand in case they arise. What if the dying person starts having trouble breathing and the doctor says a ventilator might be needed? Maybe one family member wants the healthcare team to do everything possible to keep this relative alive. What does that involve? Or what if the family members cannot agree on end-of-life care or they disagree with the doctor? What happens then? Here are some common end-of-life issues. They will give you a general understanding and may help conversations with the doctors. And I'm going to add with the family as well. Just in case if you all, because I know when there's a lot of things going on, somebody's dying in the family, there's a lot of emotions flaring up, I guess I should say that. And people are, of course, back and forth with different things and how they feel, what was promised and what's going on and don't understand and this can't be the case and that kind of thing. Like I said, sometimes you have to, of course, ask different questions. You have to, of course, go over different things with the family members. Of course, everybody may not agree, but of course, we have, you have to make sure that you are talking to the family about these issues and the doctors 
about these issues so you all can kind of get as much as you can on the same accord. In that first conversation, uh, the first general conversation that you can, of course, start with is if we say do everything possible, what does that mean? So if the family's asking, do everything possible for my family member, what does that mean? This means that if someone is dying, all measures that might keep vital organs working will be tried. For example, using a ventilator to support breathing or starting dialysis for failing kidneys. Such life support can sometimes be a temporary measure that allows the body to heal itself and begin to work normally again. It is not intended to be used indefinitely in someone who is dying. As we all know, we are not gods, and the doctors are not gods, and neither are these machines. So nobody can stop the dying process. If it's going to happen, some of these things, like they just talked about, the dialysis for failing kidneys or the ventilator to help someone breathe, those are just temporary solutions. And you still would have to, of course, get to the point where you would have to eventually make some kind of decision about the dying person and what you want to do as far as end of life and how long you want to, of course, prolong their care or their, um, or their approaching death. I guess I put it that way as well. I know that doesn't sound good, but like I said, we all have to go through this similar, these similar situations. It's not easy at all, but, we, but neither one of us can stop God, neither can the doctors or the machine. The next question that you all can think about, what can be done if someone's heart stops beating, which is called cardiac arrest? CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, can sometimes restart a stopped heart. It is most effective in people who are, who are generally healthy before their heart stops. During CPR, the doctor repeatedly presses, uh, pushes on the chest with great force and periodically puts air into the lungs. Electronic shocks, called defibrillation, may also be used to correct an abnormal heart rhythm, and sometimes medicines might also be given. Although not usually shown on TV, the force required for CPR can cause broken ribs or collapsed lungs. Often, CPR does not succeed in older adults who have multiple chronic illnesses or who are already frail. So like I said, for CPR, I know we, of course, see that on TV. We see it. We may have seen it in person or at the hospital, that kind of thing. They usually will not do CPR on somebody who already is, whose health is already failing, and it may not help their, their quality of life or who is already frail. Because if they're going to press down on somebody who's thin and frail, they can break more than just a few ribs and, of course, puncture their lungs and that kind of thing, causing more issues and more heartache quickly, more quickly than what was um, necessary. So the next question is, what if someone needs help breathing or completely stops breathing, which is called um, respiratory arrest? If a patient has a severe breathing problem or has stopped breathing, a ventilator may be needed. A ventilator is a machine that forces the lungs to work. Initially, this involves intubation, which is putting a tube attached to a ventilator down the throat into the trachea or windpipe. Because this tube can be quite uncomfortable, People are often sedated with very strong intravenous medicines. Restraints may also be used to prevent them from pulling out the tube. If the person needs a ventilator support for more than a few days, the doctor might suggest something called a tracheotomy, sometimes called a trach, which rhymes with the word make. This tube is then attached to the ventilator. This is more comfortable than a tube down the throat and may not require sedation. Inserting the tube into a trachea is a bedside surgery. A tracheotomy can carry a risk, including a collapsed lung, a plugged tracheotomy tube, or bleeding. So just keep that in mind. Those are different things that you can do for a person who, of course, have, or is having trouble breathing or who completely just stops breathing. They have the ventilator or they can try a tracheotomy as well. How, uh, the next question, how can I be sure the medical staff knows that we don't want efforts to restore a heartbeat or breathing. Tell the doctor in charge as soon as the patient or person making the medical health care decisions decide that CPR or other life support procedures should not be performed and that you all have to make that decision before they start the process. The doctor will then write this on the patient's chart using terms such as DNR, do not resuscitate, or DNAR, do not attempt to resuscitate, and allow natural death, or DNI, do not intubate. DNR forms 
Do not resuscitate forms. Vary by state and also are usually available online. So if you are looking for those forms, they usually are online. You just have to go online in your search bar and put them in. I guess D, I guess I was well, search for DNR forms in the state of Missouri since I'm here in the state of Missouri. If um, end of life care is given at home, a special non hospital DNR signed by a doctor is needed. <clears throat> this ensures that if medical, I mean, emergency medical technicians or EMTs are called to the house, they will respect your, wish, your wishes and not resuscitate the victim or the, um, the, the dying person. Make sure it is kept in a prominent place so EMTs can see it. Without a non-hospital, do not resuscitate order. In many states, EMTs are required to, form, to perform CPR or similar techniques. Hospice staff can help determine whether a, med whether a medical condition is part of the natural dying process or something that needs attentions of, of the attention of EMTs. So just keep that in mind, you all. Once you download your forms from the website, no matter what state you're in, uh, make sure they're filled out, of course, and you all have signed them and all those kind of things. Some will require a notary, so make sure you um, keep that in mind as well. But make sure that you put those forms somewhere where you can find them, easy like on your table or on top of your TV, on um, the coffee table, that kind of thing. So when the so when you have to call 911, the EMTs come out with the ambulance, that you can, of course, show them the forms and let them know that you do not want your loved one resuscitated or you don't want any kind of CPR performed. Um, you just want them to, of course, go peacefully, I guess I put it that way. And you have to make sure that you let them know that because if not, they are going to go ahead and save their life any kind of way that they deem possible. DNR orders do not stop all treatment. That only means that CPR and the ventilator will not be used. These orders are not permanent. They can be changed if the situation changes. So just keep in mind, do not resuscitate orders. Only include and mean no CPR and no ventilator to be used on your loved one. There are other measures that may be able to be taken, I guess I put it that way as well. And these are not permanent orders. If you want something to change or you want the, or the person starts getting better, they can always be changed or thrown away if you don't need them anymore. The next one, what about pacemakers or similar devices? Should they be turned off? A pacemaker is a device implanted under the skin on the chest that keeps a, regular, a heartbeat regular. It will not keep a dying person alive. Just keep in mind, a pacemaker will not keep a dying person alive. Some people have an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD, under the skin. An ICD shocks the heart back into regular rhythm when needed. The ICD should be turned off <clears throat> at the point when the life support is no longer wanted. This can be done at bedside without surgery. So that's something that you all, your loved one has, and the person is dying and you no longer want life support, since that's something that keeps them alive, you can have them remove or cut off the ICD. In the next one, what if the doctor suggests a feeding tube? If a patient can't or won't eat or drink, the doctor might suggest a feeding tube to, of course, still give them nutrients. While a patient recovers from an illness, getting nutrition temporarily through a feeding tube can be helpful. But at the end of life, a feeding tube might cause more, dis more discomfort than eating. For people with dementia, tube feeding does not prolong life or, pre or, or prevent aspiration. As death approaches, loss of appetite is common. Body systems start shutting down and fluids and foods are not needed as before. Some experts believe that at this point, few nutrients are absorbed from any type of nutrition, including those received through a feeding tube. Farther, after a feeding tube is inserted, the family might need to make a difficult decision about when or if to remove it. If tube feeding will be tried, there are two methods that, that can be used. In the first, a feeding tube, known as a nasogastric or NG tube, is threaded through the nose down to the stomach to give nutrition for a short time. Sometimes this tube is uncomfortable. Someone with an NG tube might try to remove it. This usually means the person has to be restrained, which could mean binding his or, hand, his or her hands to the bed. If tube feeding is required for an extended time, then a gastric or G tube is put directly into the stomach through an opening made in the side or the abdomen. This second method is sometimes called a PEG 
percutaneous endoscopic gastronomy too. It carries risk of infection, pneumonia, and nausea. Hand feeding, some kind, sometimes called assisted oral feeding, is an alternative to feeding. Is, is, is an alternative to tube feeding. This approach may have fewer risk, especially for people with dementia. So the next one, should someone who is dying be sedated? Sometimes for patients very near the end of life, the doctor might suggest sedation to manage symptoms that are not responding to other treatments and are still making the patient, the patient uncomfortable. These, this means using medication to put the person in a sleep-like state. Many doctors suggest continuing to use comfort care measures like pain medicine, even if the dying person is sedated. Sedatives can be stopped at any time. A person who is sedated may still be able to hear what you are saying. So try to keep speaking directly to, not about him or her. Do not say things you will not want the patient to hear. The next one, excuse me, just what about antibiotics? That's the next thing to ask and to be clear about. Antibiotics are medicine that fight infections caused by bacteria. Lower respiratory infections, such as pneumonia and urinary tract infections, are often caused by bacteria and are common in older people who are dying. Many antibiotics have side effects, so the value of trying to treat an infection and a dying person should be weighed against any unpleasant side effects. If someone is already dying when the infection began, giving anti antibiotics is probably not going to prevent death, but may make the person feel more comfortable. It just depends on the situation and what's going on. The antibiotics can either hurt or harm the person who is dying if you wish to give it to them at the end of life. The next one says Diego's story. Diego was 83 and had lived in a nursing home for several years with advanced Parkinson's disease. One day, he choked on some food, causing him to inhale a small amount into his lungs. As a result, Diego developed aspiration pneumonia. The doctor assured his wife that they would keep Diego comfortable without any antibiotics, but she wanted them to try treating his pneumonia. He died a few days later despite their efforts. The next question are things to get clear on. Is treating, I mean, is refusing treatment legal? Choosing to stop treatment is not curing or controlling an illness or deciding to start a new treatment. It's completely legal whether the choice is made by the person who is dying or by the person making the health care decision. I'm going to read that over you all. Choosing to stop treatment that is not curing or controlling an illness or deciding not to start a new treatment is completely legal whether the choice is made by the person who is dying or the person making health care decision. So that means choosing to stop treatment that is not curing the person's illness or controlling an illness or deciding to not do any new treatments. Does, it is completely legal in all states that we know of to help the person who is dying. Some people think this is like allowing death to happen. The law does not consider refusing treatment to be either suicide or euthanasia sometimes called mercy killings. So the law does not look at that. It's refusing treatment as, as a process of suicide or euthanasia, so it is completely legal. It's up to the family, you all, and, and the dying person, if they can still speak and talk, or what they want to do. But it is legal, and that's something that you all have to think about as well. The next question. What if the doctor and I have different opinions about care for someone who is dying? Sometimes medical staff, the patient, and family members can disagree about a medical decision. This can be especially problematic when the dying person can't tell the doctors what kind of end-of-life care he or she wants. For example, the family might want more active treatment, like chemotherapy, than the doctors think will be helpful. If there is an advanced directive explaining the person's preferences, those guidelines should determine the care. Without the guidance of an advanced directive, is there, if there is a disagreement about medical care, it may be necessary to get a second opinion from a different doctor or to consult the ethics committee or patient representative, also known as the ombudsman of the hospital or the facility. Palliative care consultation may also be helpful. An arbitrator or mediator can sometimes assist people 
for different views to agree on a plan. And those ways could be used also if you all are having disagreements with the doctor and other medical staff about what you want or what kind of care you want for your loved one. Just keep in mind, they have ombudsmen and usually those are free services to use. Um, you can have the, um, the palliative care consultation team to assist. Or you can, of course, just talk to the doctor trying to see what you all can come up with or the ethics committee or a patient representative. So just keep those things in mind. The next, the doctor does not seem familiar with our family values about, our family views and values about dying. What should we do? America is a rich melting pot of religious, races, and cultures. Ingrained in each tradition are expectations about what should happen as life nears its end. It's, it is important for everyone involved in the patient's care to understand how each family background may influence expectations, needs, and choices. Your background may be different from that of the doctor with whom you are working, or you might be used to a different approach to making healthcare decisions at the end of life than your medical team. <clears throat> for example, many healthcare providers look to a single person, the dying person or his or her chosen representative for important healthcare decisions at the end of life. But in some cultures, the entire immediate family takes on that role. It is helpful to discuss your personal and family traditions <clears throat> with your doctors and nurses. If there are religious or cultural customs surrounding death that are important to you, make sure to tell your healthcare providers. Knowing these practices will be honored, com could comfort the dying person. <clears throat> Excuse me, Lord have mercy. Telling the medical staff ahead of time may also help avoid confusion and misunderstanding when death occurs. Make sure you understand how the available medical team I mean, medical options pre pre presented by the healthcare team fit into your family's desires for end of life care. So if you all are different customs, traditions, religions, that kind of thing, make sure that you all are, of course, expressing that to the medical staff so they can know what you all are, of course, are expecting to happen at the end of life, just in case their values are different than what the hospital has to provide. Questions to ask about healthcare decisions. Here are some questions you might want to ask the medical staff. What is the care plan? What are the benefits and risk? How often should we reassess the care plan? If we're trying to use the ventilator to help with breathing and decide to stop, how will that be done? What's that process? If my family member is dying, why does he or she have to be connected to all those tubes and machines? Why do we need more tests? What is the best way for our family to work with the care staff? How can I make sure I get daily updates on my family member's condition. Will you call me if, a ch if there is a change in his or her condition? Those are definitely questions to ask the healthcare team as far as dealing with your loved one and trying to make sure that they have the best care possible and that the family is informed, of course, of what's going on as well. And these, at the end it says, um, thoughts to share. Make sure that your healthcare team know what is important to yourself and your family surrounding the, the end of life. You might say, in my religion, we then describe your religious traditions regarding death. Where we come from, tell them what customs are important to you at the end of death. In our family, when someone is dying, we prefer then go ahead and, and describe what you hope to have happen because they won't know if we don't tell them. They're only the hospital staff. They, they have their own traditions and values as well. And they have, the, of course, the policies of the hospital. And that's what they're usually following. So make sure that you let them know that if you have different varying opinions or the way you do things, I guess, like near your inner life, your, your own traditions, your religion, your, your family, that kind of thing. Make sure that you speak up and speak out and tell the medical staff, not just sit back and be complacent and do nothing. Make sure that you let them know that you are, um, that you all have different opinions about that. Now, at the end of this, this gives some resources, a few resources about um, helping you uh, make helping you learn more about making health care decisions. And it's talking about the Association for Conflict Resolution, which you can search online as well. And they're talking about the Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, I don't have any services offhand that's in St. Louis besides the main one that I usually deal with is the End of Life Coalition. They have the End of Life Coalition covering the entire state, um, well, city, county areas of St. Louis, Missouri. 
Um, I'm assuming probably part of the, uh, mo well, most of the state as well. So like I said, just make sure that you contact them if you are in Missouri. It's called the End of Life Coalition, and they have all of these resources, of course, on their website. If you call the staff, they can, of course, talk to you about them as well. They also have workshops and trainings, and I have been to many of those to, of course, educate myself when dealing with my own clients and family about the end of life care. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this video. But this, of course, is part five on the end of life care, helping with comfort and care. And this one is called Understanding the Healthcare Decisions that can, of course, impact your loved one when you are with your loved one and the family to make those decisions when your loved one is near the end of life. So make sure that you keep these things in mind. And if you don't remember all of them, that kind of thing, please go back, look at the video, and write these topics down. Write down the questions just in case you want to ask your doctor the same thing or similar things, especially if that's going to help you all in your situation with your loved one that is dying. So, so with that, I just want to thank you all for, of course, tuning in to this video about healthcare decisions during the end of life. And I want to, um, like I said, we, um, for those in Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, do contact the End of Life Coalition for any questions, concerns, that kind of thing that you may have dealing with your loved one. They can connect you with hospice. They can, they can connect you with palliative care and all those kind of services, attorneys and that kind of thing as well. So let's keep that in mind. Um, but like I said, I'm going to go ahead and get off here. Thank you for watching Part 5, and I appreciate you all for being here. Once again, this is, this is Tanetta Clay. And this is my channel here on YouTube. And I would appreciate if you do, of course, subscribe to my channel. And, of course, uh, click the notification bell so you can get notified whenever I do my videos um, or whenever I post my videos here on YouTube. With that, everybody take care. Have a good one.